All right, so welcome everyone. It looks like we've just crossed over to 5 o'clock, so thank you for joining us for Facebook Live and our program on uh, War of the Worlds, Blazing Mars, we're calling it. Mars is looking fantastic in our skies for all of October, and we're also going to be talking about the War of the Worlds uh, scandal or fiasco or major media event that occurred 82 years ago this coming October 30. So I'm Mike, the Planetarium Director, and our program is going to be exploring those two topics. If you have questions about astronomy, go ahead and put those in the chat. Krista on our staff is there to answer your questions. And uh, also, we would love your feedback and whether you think 5 o'clock, the time we have right now for this special offering of the show, is a time that works better or not as well as our normal 1 o'clock time. We are choosing an evening time in part because of the fact that Mars is really awesome all this month, and you can kind of go out shortly after our show is over and check out Mars actually in the sky. Now, the planetarium at uh, Liberty Science Center, the Jennifer Chaucer, Chaucer Planetarium, is in fact uh, open now. We are open Thursdays through Sundays and are doing shows every hour at that time. And in fact, the same folks that do our online programming which is Krista and Andrew and I are also the ones in the Dome giving programs Thursdays through Sundays at LSC. So I'm hoping we'll be able to see some of you actually at our mothership where we do our work. So let's talk about, first of all, War of the Worlds. Uh, so these two gentlemen in, you see them together, these are the two Wellses that are part of our story. This is H.G. Wells and Orson Wells. So H.G. Wells, the one with the mustache, wrote the novel War of the Worlds in 1897. And uh, so H.G. wrote that Orson, unrelated to H.G. Wells, dramatized that story on October 30, 1938, in a radio broadcast in which they told the story as if it was really happening, as if Martians had landed in New Jersey and were taking over America from there. Up to a million people heard that broadcast and believed it was actually going on that night. We'll talk about why that is in the course of our show and talk about the long impact of that uh, original example, I suppose, of fake news. So that's one question about all of this, is why did people believe that Martians had invaded planet Earth just based on an entertaining radio show in 1938? And so the... Uh, Origins go a long way back. They go back to the idea of Mars in mythology being the god of war and aggression. And so if Orson Welles' broadcast in 1938 had talked about invaders from the planet Venus, I don't think anyone would have panicked. But Mars had already, already always meant aggression and warfare, and Marshall, for example, also comes from the word for Mars. Now, Mars itself, as a planet, it was a pretty intriguing and frustrating object. So Galileo did turn his newfangled telescope on the planet Mars in 1610, in September of that year. But what he saw did not impress him. It was a little fuzzy ball with little markings on it, but it didn't provide the awesome views that the moon provided in his telescope or that he saw when he discovered the four moons of Jupiter with his newfangled telescope. What had to happen is that telescopes had to get better. Mars is small. It's a little tiny target, 4,000 miles in diameter. And so telescopes had to get better, which they did by the middle of the 17th century. So by the time of Christian Huygens here, in the middle of the 17th century, telescopes got good enough that he could actually sketch a large feature on Mars that we now realize is the plane called Certus Major. And with that, they could also figure out by seeing how long it took it to go around the planet that Mars had a day not unlike a day on Earth. A day on Mars is 24 hours and 37 minutes, so not much longer than an Earth day. So already some evidence that Mars had some Earth-like qualities. But still, it remains frustrating because you're looking at this planet that's so small, so far away, and you're seeing it through the dense atmosphere of Earth. But astronomers are not ones for giving up, and so a number of astronomers tried to make sense out of the red planet. One of the leading lights in that in the late 19th century was Giovanni Schiaparelli in Italy, who would sit at the eyepiece night after night, 
wait for the occasional rare moment of clear seeing, and then sketch what he saw when Mars came clearly into view. And here is what he saw. Now, he called these lines on Mars canali, which in Italian means channel, although it very quickly got mistranslated into English as being canal. And there's one important difference between a channel and a canal. Canals are made by somebody or something. And if you believe that Mars has canals, you have to believe that Mars has Martians. So a man who is really a proselytizer for life on Mars is one of the last great amateur astronomers. Percival Lowell, born in Boston, became obsessed by Mars uh, circa 1893. And he went to Arizona, built the Lowell Observatory, which is still there in Flagstaff, and spent night after night, much like Schiaparelli did, observing the red planet in his telescope and sketching what he saw in those moments of clear seeing. But Mr. Schiaparelli did not believe in the same way that Lowell did that these canals were actually signs of intelligent life. That was the theory of Lowell. He saw 437 canals on Mars, and he had a theory. He believed Mars was a home of an advanced race, but that Mars was losing its water. That's why it was desert colored. And so in literally a last-ditch effort, the Martians built canals to bring water from the polar caps to the central cities. Lowell's reasoning is that Martians had to be highly advanced and peaceful because none of these 437 canals went around national boundaries. They were just a straight shot, get the water from the polar caps to the central cities as fast as possible. Nonetheless, if you believe that Mars is the home of an advanced race and believe that Mars is drying out, and if Mars has always, always, always meant aggression and warfare, it's not a difficult leap to imagine non-peaceful Martians. And that was the idea behind War of the Worlds, which is published originally in Pearson's magazine as a ser in, a, in serial form, and then became, uh, was released as a novel a year later in 1898. So there's a lot of unattractive Martians out there, but perhaps the least attractive of all are the ones conceived of by H.G. Wells. They are octopus-like creatures that move very slowly in the heavy gravity of Earth. Mars is small and its gravity is low. And so they have to travel around in these three-legged war machines. And they also didn't quite have lasers, because lasers uh, didn't exist back then, but they had heat rays. And nothing that the human race threw at the Martians in this novel could stop the Martians. And it seemed like the Martians were going to take over the planet. They were stopped because they had not been exposed to earthly bacteria. They essentially caught the common cold, and they all died. But uh, the story had a lot of re resonance. It was one of Wells' most successful. It was also intended as an analogy for colonialism. He would watch what would happen, say, when the English went to... Um, Tasmania and the terrible impact on the population there and said, well, what if Martians come to Earth? Wouldn't it be much the same thing? So there's that idea. Martians, life on Mars, Mars invaders, that's one strand. Another strand in our story that would lead us to the Orson Welles broadcast was the development of radio. Now, my, uh, my parents are of the only generation, as my dad often said, that was the radio generation, where radio was the main form of entertainment in the household. It began in the 20s and went to the 40s. And especially in the Depression, it was the cheapest form of entertainment. Investing in a radio meant you would have all of this great music and all of this great news reporting in your home. So 1921, there were a million radios in the country. And by War of the Worlds, at the time of that broadcast, 1938, there were nearly 30 million households that had radios. And it was a form of entertainment. So radio's evolution coincided with the invention of the modern microphone and the development of singers like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, who had a perfect voice, an intimate voice for singing on the radio. But not only was it a form of entertainment, they realized it came out to be seen very quickly as a way to get important breaking news very quickly. And two examples of that both occurred in New Jersey. So in 1932, 
the infant son of Charles Lindbergh, the great aviator, was kidnapped from his house in Hopewell, New Jersey. And people wanted to know desperately if there were any updates. The day after the kidnapping, the New York Times got 2,000 calls to their offices saying, what's going on? What's going on? Well, the New Jersey radio station realized that they could be that way of getting breaking news to people. They went to Lindbergh's house and for 150 hours broadcast the story of the kidnapping. And it made it very clear that radio was much more nimble than the print media for getting important information out to folks right away. Uh, another example of that, perhaps even more famous nowadays, was, the, was also a thing that occurred in New Jersey. The, uh, the Hindenburg arriving from Germany exploded in Linden, New Jersey upon arriving. A newspaper man named Morrison was there to record it his commentary of the explosion saying over and over, oh, the humanity, oh, the humanity is now a famous meme. Uh, he actually wasn't doing it live, even though most radio was live in those days, but the recording he made played all over the radio the next day and brought this vivid disaster to life. Now, also, things were really heating up in Europe in the late 1930s, and just before the War of the World broadcast, it looked like war was going to break out. 1938, the, uh, Hitler said he was going to go to war if he wasn't ceded the, the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland. And it really seemed like that was it, that war was not to be avoided. But in Munich, Neville Chamberlain, seen here, made an agreement, a concession to Hitler, as it were, came back, declared, I have given you peace in our time, Hitler declared he would do no more aggression, and the war seemed to be halted right before it broke out. So folks were used to hearing about military actions and invasions on the radio a lot. So all of these strands were coming together as we were heading towards the War of the Worlds broadcast. The radio being used for disasters, for breaking news, for being an intimate way to get information right into your household. And then on top of all of that, we are going to go then and look at a person from Kenosha, Wisconsin, named Orson Wells. Again, no relation to H.G. Wells. So born in the Midwest, uh, his mother was a pianist, his father was an inventor. He uh, did theater, actually in Ireland, talked himself into going on stage in Ireland when he was in his teens still, and then came back and got work in the theater in New York around 1937. Now, a few years later, he would both star in and direct what many regard as the greatest American film of all time, Citizen Kane. And in fact, it was largely because of the War of the Worlds panic that he came to Hollywood's attention. But at this point, Wells was working in the theater, the Mercury Theater it was called, and they were doing great work. So, for example, they did a version of Julius Caesar by Shakespeare in which Orson Welles played Brutus. And nowadays, and I say this as a Shakespeare scholar, it's a real cliche to do Shakespeare in modern dress. That wasn't the case, though, back in the uh, 1930s. And so when they mounted Julius Caesar, set in fascist Italy, it seemed incredibly connected and relevant and breathed new life into Shakespeare's drama. So that got him noticed. And CBS Radio, which was trying to find a way to do interesting programming as the upstart new radio station, approached the Mercury Theater and said, why don't you do your Mercury Theater on the radio? They set up a deal where every uh, once a week, originally on Monday nights at 9 o'clock, they would come and do a play, usually based on a great work of literature like Treasure Island, for example. And the director and sort of main face of this project was uh, Orson Welles. He brought over a lot of his players from the Mercury Theater, many of whom would also appear in Citizen Kane and others of his films. It was actually kind of a hothouse for really great talent. And their first production, now you think this would be the Halloween show, but actually this was done in July. Their first production was Bram Stoker's Dracula, and it was an instant hit. People loved it. The attention to detail that Wells used with this programming was really fantastic. He wanted to simulate the moment when the stake gets driven into Dracula's heart. The final solution was to get a giant watermelon and hit that with a hammer, and the squelching sound it made was very, very realistic. 
Now, we can post in the chat as well. We have there, all of these shows are available on one website. We can uh, post a link to that if you want to hear any of these radio dramas that were done by the Mercury Theater. But that did great. They loved it. It was very successful. They eventually moved the show to 8 o'clock on Sundays. And for their 17th production, they decided to take the novel War of the Worlds and turn that into a radio drama. And okay, so that was a big concern, was that it was seen as kind of an old-fashioned, boring story. And there was a lot of debate about whether they should do it or not. But then Orson Welles is a real driver saying, what if we do this story in a series of news flashes as if Martians are really invading the planet right now. It's the same kind of contemporary angle you saw them putting with, on with the Julius Caesar production. So to write it, they brought in Howard Koch, who would later become famous in a few years as a screenwriter for Casablanca, which you say, see here, the uh, Ingrid Bergman, uh, Humphrey Bogart movie. So Koch here, kind of new to this project, on Monday, before the Sunday broadcast, six days before, gets the assignment. Your job in six days is to come up with a radio play for War of the Worlds. There's a lot here that resonates with Saturday Night Live. For example, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be ready, in this case, at 8 o'clock on, on uh, Sunday for the programming. <clears throat> and so he didn't like the idea. He thought, this novel is so boring, is anyone going to really care about us retelling this old story, but Wells kept on saying, no, make it seem as real as possible, like it's really happening. So Koch decided to drive around New Jersey, get some inspiration, got a map of New Jersey, got a gas station, plunked his finger down. Underneath his finger were the words Grover's Mill. So Grover's Mill became the site where the Martians were going to invade our planet. Now in this hot house of talent, you had not only this great script writer, but also a thing to realize about radio in those days is that none of the music was recorded. That was anathema. You always had a live orchestra. So there was a good-sized orchestra for this Mercury Theater program. And as their conductor and composer, they had the young Bernard Herrmann, who would later become the go-to composer for Hitchcock's movies for the soundtracks. He wrote the score to Psycho. And he would stay around long enough to actually compose the score for Taxi Driver, uh, the Martin Scorsese movie. But he was a young man at the time and actually had to simulate jazz music, which was a real stretch for him in 1938, trying to make his uh, symphonic band sound like a jazz band. But there he was also composing and conducting the live music uh, with the program. So Koch starts writing, writes it on Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday night, Orson Welles hears the first draft on a, on a record that's delivered to him late at night, goes, it's just not exciting enough. Make it seem more and more and more real. Put real pauses in, like you hear on real news broadcasts. Have folks stumble over their words and use um. Make it seem as real as possible. So they were still had some doubt about whether or not it would be a disaster, not because of scaring people, but because it would bore people. Until the final dress rehearsal, when they heard the music that Herman had composed, they began to feel like, oh yeah, this, this just might actually work. So it was all live. They decided again to have the Martians land in Grover's Mill and do the story as a series of news flashes with rather innocent sounding dance band music interrupted occasionally by a flash seen on Mars and then an announcement that a meteorite had apparently landed next to Grover Mill, New Jersey. So you can get a sense for the dynamic in this great, great picture. So here we have Orson Welles with his hands above his head like he's a great conductor. The real conductor in the background, Bernard Herrmann, is conducting the orchestra, and the players are all gathered around to bring this story to life. And so the idea was that they report a flash on Mars, play some more really kind of boring dance band music, then report that something has landed in Grover Mill, more boring dance music, and then a bunch of folks gather around a reporter who's been sent out to do a live transmission of this cylinder that has crashed into a field at Grover's Mill. And so I'm going to play just a minute excerpt from the radio broadcast so you can hear what it sounded like. 
Uh, the description of the Martians is really disgusting. Listen for the description of mucus, slime coming out of their mouths, their tentacles. They're as big as a bear, and they're slithering around in a way that kind of freaks out our reporters. So here's a little bit of what it sounded like when folks were listening to this broadcast uh, in 1938. Back. Take off! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone calling someone or something. I can see turning out of that black hole two luminous discs. Are the eyes, it might be a face, might be almost the heavens. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body. Now it's large, as large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather, but that face, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is that's kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, quiver and pulsate, and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now, and the crowd falls back. It, Seen plenty that most of the time experience, ladies and gentlemen. I can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. So he describes the uh, Martians as having V shaped mouths with slime pouring out of them, and he clearly does seem to be conveying a breathless sense. The sound effects people, including, as you see here, Aura Nichols, who was a pioneer in radio sound engineering, also really helped to bring the story to life with the sound effects. And they do follow the developments of the main theme of War of the Worlds well, in that although the Martians are first thought to be harmless because they can't move very well, they then rise up on these giant three-legged war machines and wind up blasting the land. And so the, uh, the final excerpt I'll play, another a minute worth. Rust and it'll all be over. Now, wait a minute, I see something on top of the cylinder. No, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilma Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. A tub, rather. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal, kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. What? It's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. Long pregnant pause. We're still in the recording. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. So a lot of things really help to convey the reality of this. Long pauses, stumblings over their words... Uh, but also amazing sound effects, and also, by sheer coincidence, this, t this radio show didn't have a sponsor yet. Five weeks later, Campbell Soups would come on as our sponsor, and if Campbell Spook, uh, Soups was sponsoring this show, you would have had commercials about how wonderful Campbell Soups were every 10 minutes in the show. But without a sponsor, the show ran for 42 minutes before any kind of a break, which really helped to give a sense of, of reality to it. So we don't really know how bad the panic really was. We do have stories that folks did try to escape from central New Jersey on the train. They were afraid enough. There's also rumors of an attempted suicide that was stopped in the nick of time. And also a story that folks took their shotguns, went out to try, try to find these war machines, as described in the radio broadcast with the three legs, thought they saw one on the horizon, fired away, and destroyed the Grover's Mill water tower. So... It had some impact, probably primarily on New Jersey and parts of New York, uh, although the real nightmare might have actually been for Orson Welles and the radio staff. They realized something big was going on when halfway through the show, the police showed up. They were getting so many calls asking about the Martian invasion, and they were trying to get Orson Welles to shut down the production. They said, wait a minute, we're going to have our first announcement break in one minute. So at 42 minutes into the show, they did the break saying this is a recalling of War of the Worlds. But that night, with regular grilling from the newspaper and from the police, also Orson Welles and his team didn't know how bad the panic had been. 
There were some current concerns that folks might have been killed in a crush of running to the exit, trying to cram onto, onto trains. So it could have been an absolute disaster, although as it turned out, although there was in fact one broken arm of the woman you see here, there were no fatalities, and what could have been a total disaster turned into actually a really good thing for Mr. Wells in that Hollywood, impressed by its dramatic skills, came knocking and would go on to make War, uh, Citizen Kane, perhaps the greatest American film ever made, and have a great acting career with films like The Third Man as well. But it could have been a lot worse, and it was actually a lot worse. So in 11 years later, in Quito, Ecuador, 1949, they recreated War of the Worlds on the radio in a similar format, acting like it was really happening, and folks were so angry that about being faked out and being scared that way, they attacked the radio station, and seven people were killed. So it could have gone badly. Uh, with this one story, though, the Orson Welles broadcast, it uh, not only engendered Welles' film career, but it also led to this monument you can still see in Grover's Mill to an event that never happened, with the uh, Martian craft here and Orson Welles on the radio and folks listening to that panic. So that is a little bit about uh, that dramatic, dramatic night that night that panicked the country and led to uh, one of the greatest of all uh, events, as it were, in terms of the impact of the media and the power that radio has on the imagination to suggest uh, great events. So I want to go over to our uh, video now and talk a little bit about Mars itself. So the planet Mars, as seen here, is uh, a smaller planet than Earth, and so both the Wellses knew this, so one reason why the Martians, for example, in War of the Worlds move so slowly and need the three-legged war machines is basically that in the low gravity of Mars, they got along easily, but on Earth, they had a hard time managing. If you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you weigh 38 pounds on Mars. So that was one piece of Mars fact that informed the vision of the Martians having to rely on, on war machines. Mars has seasons, it's tilted much like the Earth is tilted, so that was one of the Earth-like qualities that to folks suggested that maybe it could be an abode of life. And there are many other Earth-like qualities as well. Uh, we'll be seeing the Martian polar caps momentarily. Here we have Phobos and Deimos, these are the two moons of Mars, captured asteroids which kind of continue with the idea of Mars being scary because Phobos and Deimos mean fear and terror. The polar cap you see here, the North Polar Cap, the caps do change with the seasons and do suggest that water at least exists in frozen form on the planet Mars. The air on Mars is quite cold uh, and thin, uh, maybe 100 times as thin as the air on Earth. But the dust on Mars is so fine, having had billions of years to grind itself down, that dust devils get whipped up very nicely and very quickly. Average temperature, 100 degrees below zero, as cold as Antarctica. So as they learned more about Mars, they came to realize it wasn't really an ideal abode of life. And probably most scientists knew that even in 1938. But in the public imagination, they still had this idea of Mars as being a potential place to, to harbor life. Little Mars does have giant features, so we're looking down on this great volcano, extinct volcano called Mount Olympus, Olympus Mons, uh, the si about the size of New York State and about 13 miles high. Little Mars has giant features. Little Mars, by the way, in part because it is small, is not active ge ge geologically in the same way that, say, Venus or the Earth are. There are no canals on Mars. Those were just optical illusions. But there is one giant chasm, this Valley of the Mariners, Mariner Valley, 3,000 miles long and four miles deep, a grander canyon than our own earthly Grand Canyon, but caused by, by quake motion on Mars primarily, not by water-hungry Martians trying to get water from the polar caps to the great cities on Mars. So yeah, as far as we know, there is no life on Mars to speak of, at least not anymore. And yet, there was water on Mars once. So evidence both from our orbiters and our landers show many features forged by flowing water, 
great rushes of water sometimes. But again, it gets back to the size of Mars. Being small, Mars couldn't hold a thick atmosphere. And without a thick atmosphere, it couldn't hold its water either. So billions of years ago, Mars actually was not a red planet. It was a red and a blue planet. But the water dried up, Mars dried out, and, but it raises the interesting possibility, could there have been life beginning on Mars back in its wet days? That is one focus of the Perseverance rover, which is going to be landing on Mars on uh, February 18 of this coming year. Perseverance is going to actually collect samples of the Martian soil, store it on board for maybe a decade, and then another mission is going to come and collect that from Perseverance and take the samples back to Earth and analyze that in the laboratory. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, Mars is really bright in our skies now because it's close, and we take advantage of these close approaches also to send missions off to the red planet. Why? Well, because Mars is interesting and also because we want to live there someday. It's the eventual home of the human race. Now, if Mars did actually get life going billions of years ago when it had water, we know for a fact that bits of Mars do hit planet Earth. So what if a piece of Mars got knocked off of Mars, hit Earth, and brought life to Earth? That would mean that we're all Martians. So instead of being non-existent, there's actually perhaps billions of Martians here, and they're all right here on planet Earth. That's a not widely accepted theory, but hey, it's a possibility. And if not, if there never was life on Mars, there will be someday, because people will live there on Mars. Okay, so the fact that Mars is nice and close right now is also why Mars is blazingly great in our skies. So the last thing I wanted to do is to show you where to find it now and for the duration of 2020. So here we are going out tonight. Our sky is set for 5.30 right now, which is kind of close to the real time outside of my windows here. We're looking towards the south. Let's go to the evening sky and check out where Mars is going to be located. We're still on daylight saving time, so it still gets dark kind of late, considering that we're in the fall. So here is the sky as you'd see at 7.30, and the planet Mars will just be rising as a brilliant orange ember here at 7.30. Now Mars is blazing bright right now. It's minus 2.6 magnitude, brighter momentarily for this month of October than Jupiter. Jupiter is in the south. Now, one reason why Mars really sticks out right now is that the stars behind it are really faint. The stars of Pisces are really faint. So Jupiter is in the south, and actually it's a little bit dimmer than Mars right now. That only happens once every 26 months. But you can go out tonight, which is why we're doing this show as an evening show, and watch dueling planets. Mars rising in the east here at 7.30 or so. Jupiter in the south, and Mars actually a little brighter than Jupiter for the month of October. You can also catch Saturn, by the way. Saturn is next to uh, Jupiter. It's about the width of one palm away from the planet Jupiter. So a beautiful arrangement. Uh, planets move to their own drummer. They don't come back at the same time like the stars do, but right now we get this great gathering in the evening sky, and this is going to be the case for all the rest of October. And so Mars, since it's rising here at 7.30, it's going to be overhead a little bit past midnight. So no matter when you try to hunt for Mars in the sky, the next couple of weeks, it'll be there as long as it's clear. It'll be due south a little after midnight tonight, and then it's going to set right around the break of day. So you got Mars all night, and again, this will be the case for the next few weeks. And if you're an early riser or a late goer to better, who am I to judge your lifestyle? You can actually watch Mars uh, and Venus together in the sky. So Mars will be setting in the west in the morning sky the next two weeks as Venus rises. And although Mars has pulled ahead of Jupiter for these few weeks, neither one of them have any chance of catching blazing Venus in brightness. Minus four magnitude just means really, really, really bright many times, about 15 times brighter or so than Mars. So the brightest dot you'll ever see in the sky is Venus, and that is in the morning sky. We'll be there all the way till the end of the year, and you can compare it side by side to the planet Mars if you get up uh, early the next few weeks. And if that's not enough to inspire you to get up early, the famous 
Orion constellation is now due south. And just below Orion, you have Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Sirius, whose name means scorching in Greek, minus 1.43 magnitude. It's still several times dimmer than the planet Mars. So you have this great parade. You can carry the brightness of Mars, 2.6 magnitude, Sirius one, my, uh, minus 2.6, Sirius my, minus 1.43, and then Venus minus 4, this beautiful gathering of, of, of lights in the morning sky. So that is what you can see now and really to the end of the month. And Mars is going to stay pretty bright all the way until the year is over. But if we go just one month, it's going to drop dramatically in brightness. So the odd thing is you don't see Venus flaring in brightness or Jupiter. This special flaring of brightness is specific to Mars. It's a planet that's near to us and is a small planet, so it doesn't reflect light very well. And so a year ago, when Mars was 230 million miles away, it was really dim, no brighter than a star in the Big Dipper, for example. But all of this crazy year of 2020, the Earth is getting, playing catch up with Mars, and that distance has been diminishing between the two planets, and Mars has gotten brighter and brighter. And by the time we enter October, instead of being 230 million uh, year, uh, miles away, the planet Mars is only about 40 million miles away. So a dramatic increase in brightness. And it will stay bright, although not as bright as October. October is it for hitting its peak brightness. But if you try to find Mars next month, say in the middle of November, it'll still be pretty bright. So here we are, 545. We're now past the end of daylight saving time. We're on standard time. So 545, it's going to be dark by mid-November. And Mars will be shining, rising in the east at minus 1.4 magnitude. So three times dimmer than it is right now, although still as bright as the brightest star, Sirius. But it's interesting that in just this one month, it drops off so much in brightness. And if you go to the middle of December, you'll have another one full drop in magnitude for the planet Mars. It'll be down to minus 0.6 magnitude, but still there, blazing away in the sky. So really to the end of the year, you'll have a really nice bright Mars and it's going to stay like we're losing the other planets entirely at the end of December. So Jupiter and Saturn and Venus, great in the autumn, all gone by January. But Mars, it's going to hang on to the bitter end. We're not going to lose Mars until July 4 of 2021. But it's going to be a rather feeble-looking object in the sky by the time it says its final farewell around Independence Day. So if we go out here and check out the skies now on July 4, you'll see uh, in the western sky Venus blazing bright still and Mars all the way down to about minus 2 magnitude, roughly the same brightness as any of these stars here in the Big Dipper. So really the time to check out Mars is going to be these next three months. And you can actually observe it week by week, getting a little fainter as the distance between Earth and Mars widens. So that's a little bit about the fascinating red planet and uh, some of its impact on cultural history, the history of radio, the history really of fake news, one of the original fake news stories, the War of the Worlds broadcast, and where to find the red planet from now until uh, the end of this year especially. So with that, that's the end of our formal program. If you want to support us, we do have a donate button. We are uh, doing these programs because there's a lot of interest in these topics and your support does help us to to uh, keep these programs alive and kicking. And uh, that's the end of the formal show, but I'll check to see if there's any questions here before we wrap up our program. Yeah, so we did uh, post in the chat uh, the, the link to the recordings. Mercury Theater did many, many uh, retellings of famous stories, Treasure Island, Dracula, and so forth. And it's amazing how many of those have been preserved in their entirety. So we can post a link to that. It's just called Mercury Theater uh, Info, and it has all of these available to play, including the Great War of the Worlds. So yeah, Sirius Major is the great plane there. And uh, you put also in the chat, we've uh, put in... Uh, some information on, on telescopes. You can really get a decent telescope for around $125. Orion telescopes, named for that famous constellation in the sky, makes really good telescopes, really nice desktop units between $125 and $250. You 
easy to use. We actually use them all the time when we had evening programs, and they're also quite durable, even for events full of, of uh, very excited young kids. Yeah, again, if anyone else has any more comments in terms of uh, whether this 5 o'clock time is better versus 1 o'clock, let us know. We do want to make sure we can pitch our programming to when folks are there to, to see it. And uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Glad to see if folks are enjoying it quite a bit. And uh, our show next week is going to be Halloween-y. Again, I should mention, if I did not already, bad mic, that Orson Welles did this as a Halloween prank, very specifically. So there's sort of a Halloween connection to this War of the World story. It was done the day before Halloween, Sunday night, the 30th of uh, October. Uh, but our next show, which will uh, be on Thursday, a week from now, is going to be more specifically about Halloween and the astronomy of Halloween. A number of Halloween traditions go back to the Celtic festival of Samhain, which was based on the rising of the Pleiades, that famous star cluster. So I've often said, although I'm biased, since my name is Michael Patrick Shanahan, that uh, the most famous Irish holiday in America is not St. Patrick's Day, it's Halloween. But a lot of our Halloween traditions come directly out of Irish uh, New Year's traditions, a holiday called Samhain. And then in two weeks, our show will be about the moon. Uh, this Halloween, we have a full moon on Halloween for the first time in many, many years. And Chris will be doing a show about the moon and about the fact that it's also a mini moon, the smallest full moon of the year. So that'll be happening uh, uh, two weeks from now as our, as our uh, last of our sort of three Halloween-themed Facebook Live programs. All right, doing a final check here. And uh, I think that is it uh, for our program for now. So we do hope to see you next week for the Astronomy of Halloween or for our moon show in two weeks. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us. This show and all of our shows are available at LSC in the House. We've done nearly 30 shows already on every conceivable astronomy topic. They're all there if you wanted to look at black holes or astrology and astronomy or Asteroid Impact. We have many, many shows that you can peruse there. And come see us in our real planetarium where the same folks you see online here, Krista and Andrew and Mike, we're the ones in there as well doing our planetarium programming. Goodbye, all.